We can use Lewis theory along with another theory called valence cell electron pair repulsion theory, that's a mouthful, to predict the shapes of molecules. Understanding the geometrical shape of a molecule is really important if you're trying to find a compound that will block the active site of an HIV virus protein. Right? You need to know what the shape is. Um, this is abbreviated VSEPR. We use, usually pronounce it VESPER, even though that's, you know, kind of messing with it a little, but we get tired of saying valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. But the V, S, E, P, R stand for the first letter of each word. This theory is based on the idea that electron groups repel each other. So repulsion, electron pair repulsion. So the electron pairs are repelling each other. Ew, get away from me. I don't want to be near you. This reminds me of children in the back of the minivan. Um, the repulsion between the negative charges of those electron groups on the central atom is what determines the geometry of the molecule. So let's look at carbon dioxide. To predict the shape of Vesper theory, we need to have the Lewis structure. We've already gone over that, so I'm not going to take the time to draw all of these. We're just going to say, oh, look, there it is. So here's the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the central atom. We're going to keep it simple and just look at uh, compounds that have central atoms. So we look at the central atom and we say, well, how many electron groups are there? I skipped something on this slide. What is an electron group? Each of these counts as one electron group. A lone pair, that's one group. A single bond is one group. A double bond is one group. A triple bond is one group. Okay. I know a triple bond has six electrons in it, but it's one group. So on this, we have a double bond here. That's a group. And a double bond here. That's a group. These are trying to get away from each other. So you could think of this is the planet Earth, and this is you, and this is that horrible X of yours. And wherever he, she is, you're going to live on the opposite side of the planet to get as far away as possible. Immense repulsion, right? So you try to get away from each other. So the way that these two groups can get away from each other is to be on opposite sides of the carbon atom. And when that happens, these atoms form a line. And so we say that this molecule is linear because the three atoms are in a line. The angle, we're talking about the angle between these electron groups around the central atom, the angle is 180 degrees. Well, let's look at another molecule. We drew this one before, H2CO. This is the central atom, the one that everything else is attached to. How many groups are there? One, two, three. The double bond is one group because those four electrons are between the carbon and the oxygen. They can't get away from each other. They're stuck here. They can't swing away from each other. So three groups. The way three groups can get away from each other is by making a triangle. So we had the, the line, and now we've got another one in here. And these guys are like, ew, we got to get away from him, but I guess that means I have to get closer to you. Um, but they're going to maximize the angle between them. So we take 360, divide it into three, and these bond angles are 120 degrees. This is called trigonal planar because it's a triangle that's in a plane. It's flat. Trigonal planar. Bond angles are 120 What about methane, CH4? There's the Lewis structure. There's no dots here because there's no lone pairs. But we look at the carbon, how many groups? Four. So now we have four things trying to get away from each other. You might say, well, that looks good right there. That's as far away from each other as they can get. But atoms aren't limited to two dimensions. So when you put a fourth one in here, it actually pops into a more three-dimensional thing. 
and we have what's called a tetrahedron. That's a geometric shape with four triangular faces. A cube is a shape with six square faces. A tetron has four, tetrahedron has four triangular faces. The angles in the tetrahedron are 109.5 degrees. That's the best it can do, getting these guys away from each other. What about ammonia, NH3? Here's the Lewis structure. How many groups? One, two, three, four. Four groups. Lone pairs are groups. Lone, lone pairs are actually slightly more repulsive than bonds are. So the electron geometry, that's the arrangement of the electron groups, is tetrahedral. So here's a picture of that. You've got the three hydrogen atoms with their single bonds being groups, and then we've got this lone pair. But the lone pair, I think of it as being an invisible balloon. You can't see it. It's so tiny, you can't see it. When we talk about the shape of the molecule, the molecular geometry, we're just wanting to know where are the atoms. So you have to look at the lone pair. The lone pair affects the position of the atoms because it repels the single bonds. But when you talk about the geometry of the molecule, you're looking at this. So it's like you have an invisible thing up here. So with my balloons, so this is a trigonal pyramid because it goes up in the middle. The reason that this is up and these guys are a little bit down is because of this lone pair. The lone pair is there. We don't draw it in this picture because here we're just drawing the atoms. There's no atom up there. So another way to think of it, let me get my right colored marker here. So here we have here we have this guy, and we're okay with the four groups making a tetrahedron. Okay with that? So we're going to keep everything as it is, but we're going to get rid of the stuff we can't see. And then ask ourselves, well, what's the shape of that? Well, it's not trigonal planar because it's not flat. So we call it trigonal pyramid or trigonal pyramidal. Okay. Again, the lone pair is exerting its influence. Any questions about that one? Let's look at water. There's a Lewis structure for water. How many electron groups? Four. Four. Two lone pairs, two bonding pairs. Well, four electrons get away from each other in what structure? Tetrahedron. Okay, tetra is the prefix for four that we used when we did uh, stoic, uh, nomenclature, right? Tetris, four things, four groups, tetrahedron. So now we're going to make a tetrahedron with the two lone pairs and the two atoms. But then we're going to look at just the molecule, I mean just the atoms. And so we can't see those guys. So what we have left is called a bent structure. They finally gave you a nice word, right? Bent. Sometimes it's called angular, but in this book they call it bent. It's just bent. Now, if we didn't know about Vesper theory, we would expect that this would be linear, right? Why not? We've got Two atoms bonded to one in the middle, it should be linear like carbon dioxide was. But it's not. And water would not have the same chemical and physical properties if it was linear. So those lone pairs are really important. Any questions? How's that for an impressive table? That one's in your book. It's a useful reference but I'm not going to give it to you on an exam. So over here, you can use it and look at, well, if I have so, this many electron groups, what's going to happen? And then from the electron groups, you have to figure out, well, how many bonding groups are there? How many lone pairs? This will tell you what the electron geometry is. For two electron groups, it's linear. 
For three, the electron geometry is trigonal planar, whether you have lone pairs or not. For four electron groups, it's going to be tetrahedral. Doesn't matter about the lone pairs for the electron geometry, because the lone pairs are electron pairs, electron groups, and they do repel. Um, here's the angles between the electron groups, and um, these are the shapes. The shapes are going to depend on whether there's lone pairs or not. So those are the um, examples, for the most part, that we looked at. So how do you predict geometry using Vesper theory? You have to start with a correct Lewis structure. Then you have to determine the number of electron groups and determine the number of bonding groups and lone pairs. Now what your book says in its example, refer to table 10.1 to determine the electron geometry and molecular geometry. I think that's terrible advice. I'm not going to give that to you on an exam. So that's not going to work. That's not good. And what do you do? You determine the electron and molecular geometries by considering how the electron groups can get as far away from each other as possible. You can stop at the dollar store on the way home and get some balloons and play with them. Or, if you have a decent imagination, you can just remember me playing with the balloons, and you can imagine, okay, well, if I have three groups, what would balloons do? Well, they'd make a flat triangle. Oh, well, that's planar, trigonal planar, right? Four is going to make that tetrahedron. If I have two lone pairs, that means two of the balloons are invisible. Okay, I'll visualize that. What's left? Well, it's going to be have an angle, and it. it's going to be bent, okay? The table is a bit overwhelming, I think. All is great information, but I think it's a bit overwhelming. You look at the Lewis structure. You see how many, how many electron groups around the central atom. You distribute those. There's three possibilities. Two groups, three groups, or four groups. We made the shapes with the balloon. The lone pairs, you just make some of the balloons invisible. And then you describe what you have left. Well, let's practice. Predict the uh, molecular geometry of CLNO. Now, we don't have instructions on how to name that in this class. Um, be careful with things like chlorine. Um, sometimes people think this is carbon and iodine. Okay, So if you're not sure, like if there's a question like this on the exam, and you're wondering, is that chlorine or is that carbon and iodine? Ask me, please. The thing about aluminum, a lot of people wrote capital A, capital L. There's no capital A on the periodic table. There's no element with just an A. Anyway, I digress. So we're told that nitrogen is the central atom. We have to draw Lewis structure first. So we're going to put the nitrogen in the middle. I'm going to put the chlorine over here. I'm going to put the oxygen over there. Next thing is how many lone pairs, I mean, how many valence electrons, how many valence electrons? How many valence electrons does chlorine have? Seven. seven. Because it's in group seven. How many does nitrogen have? Five. Because it's in group five. How many does oxygen have? Six. Because it's in group six. So I'm pretty sure that adds up to 18. So I can put 18 dots around this. I'm going to start with two in here because I need to have bonds. So that's two, four, six, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Nice. Everybody's got 8, and I didn't run out of dots. That's the starting point for predicting molecular geometry. How many electron groups around the central atom? Four. Four. There's lone pair, lone pair, single bond, single bond. They each count as one group. Four electron groups. How do four things get away from each other in three-dimensional space? Look at the balloons. What was the name of that shape? Tetrahedron. 
I'm going to draw you a tetrahedron. So here we got one in the middle, and well, that was sloppy. Let's try that again. So here I've got an atom, and here I've got an atom, and here I've got a lone pair, and here I've got a lone pair. So those are one, two, three, four groups getting away from each other. Two of them have atoms, two of them have lone pairs, just like up here. These bonds have atoms, and then I have two lone pairs. So the electron geometry is tetrahedral. For the molecular geometry, I'm going to make the lone pairs invisible. And then I look at what's left. It's bent. So the answer here is bent. This has a bent shape. Yes? So when we're trying to figure out the molecular geometry, we take away the lone pairs, or we put them as invisible? You put them as invisible. I used to talk about, well, let's pop the balloons. But if you pop the balloon, then the other balloons are going to move. Mm -hmm. They're there. We just pretend they're invisible. Okay. And if you think about how small a pair of electrons is compared to an atom, they basically are invisible. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Does that make sense? If you can think it through, it's really not that hard. You're going to have to practice thinking it through a few times. But that's definitely, I think, the, the easiest, most reliable way to learn this. Predict the molecular geometry of the SO3 to minus ion. Well, we have to start with the Lewis structure. What's probably going to be the central atom? The sulfur or one of the oxygens? We want it, the sulfur. We want it to be symmetrical. So there will be sulfur in the middle, and the oxygens are going to be around it. Then we have to count up valence electrons. Well, each oxygen has six, and the sulfur has six. So there's three times six plus one times six, so 24. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Hmm. Question? Yes, we do. Thank you. You saved me from getting to an icky part of, like, what the heck? We forgot the negative sign. Plus, whoops. I wanted to emphasize that, but not that much. Plus 2, 26. So I just finished putting in 24, and there weren't quite enough. And so we were about to have to do some sharing, but thankfully we don't have to do that. So we can put those guys in there. Now, if you're just drawing this for yourself to predict geometry, you wouldn't have to put the brackets in, but I'm just going to be correct here. And then I want to connect those dots just so I'm clear on what those are. Those are the single bonds. How many groups, electron groups, around the sulfur? Four. four. What shape does four electron groups make? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. So there's the central atom. There's one up, there's one over, there's one out, and there's one back. This time, oh, I don't want to do that one. This time I have three that are atoms and one is a lone pair. Mm -hmm. The electron geometry is tetrahedral. Now, to find the molecular geometry, I'm going to make the lone pair invisible and say, what do I have left? It's triangular, right? So it's trigonal something. Is it flat, or does it stick up like a pyramid? It sticks up. You know, that, that word's kind of hard to say. Trigonal pyramidal. Mm -hmm. 
It is a trigonal pyramid. That's easier to say. It's a trigonal pyramid. It has a trigonal pyramidal structure. Any questions? Yes. I can, but um, I don't think there's anything there. Mm -hmm. did, I, did I do it wrong? Let's try that. As I could have screwed up. So we've got 7 and 5 and 6, 18. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Yeah, I put too many electrons in. Next time, tell me sooner. <laughs> so then what do we do? Share more. So I'm going to take this lone pair off the nitrogens, and I'm going to put them over here. Oops. Is that going to change our geometry? Yeah, it is. Because now how many groups do we have in the nitrogen? Three. Double bond, single bond, lone pair. Each of those is one group. How do three things get away from each other? Triangle. So if I draw that, I have a triangle. And I have two atoms and a lone pair. The electron geometry is trigonal planar. It's a flat triangle. When I look at the molecular geometry, I make the lone pair invisible and look at what's left. What's the name of that? Bent. Yes? Does it matter where you put the electrons? Because chlorine would have seven male electrons and there's only six on its side. Does it matter where it goes? Um, that's a good question. Actually, the double bond would be between nitrogen and oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative than chlorine. But we haven't gone over things like that. For drawing the geometry, it'll come out the same. But yeah, this, the, the correct Lewis structure for this would have, um, would be like this. Ha. Because oxygen likes to have two bonds and chlorine only likes to have one. a trifecta of screw-ups. Anything else I did wrong on that one? Good questions. I, I, I really appreciate when you point out my mistakes because then I can fix them right away instead of just uh, later. Uh, representing these three-dimensional things on paper can be kind of tricky. Uh, linear isn't a problem. Trigonal planar isn't a problem. Bent, you can draw as a flat thing. It's the tetrahedral and the trigonal pyramid that are difficult. And so what we do is we use hash lines to represent things that are behind the paper or behind the screen. And we used a solid wedge to indicate things that are projecting out. Um, so this one is sticking out at us. This one is behind and these two X's are in the plane of the paper with the A. So that's something you just kind of have to practice looking at and get used to.